All right, clock on the wall says 2.45 Eastern. Let's do this thing. Thank you folks for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Damien Sinadinos. This is my first Code Palooza, uh, definitely for my first virtual Code Palooza as well. Um, I assume lots of folks, it's their first virtual conference or event, or maybe it's uh, your second or fifth, but this is a, a strange new thing that we're all dealing with here. Um, I am a, I prefer to present in person. I like being in a room with people and reading their body language and their facial expressions. And when they talk, I can hear the fluctuations and speed and pitch of their voice. And I'm cold with them and hot with them. And I really like being in a physical environment with my audience, but that's not the case today. So uh, none of those extra cues are there for me to read the, read the crowd. So please bear with me. Um, this is what I do for a living, but this is still new to me as it is to you. But anyway, let's get started. Words matter. Uh, Dave, I think, pointed out that we're, you're in for a smattering of words, plus being in person gives a chance for heckling. <laughs> yes, and sometimes people bring tomatoes and cabbage and they lob it at me, but I'm, I'm a good dodge. So, all right, words smatter. Uh, usually I start this talk by asking folks if they know what the word smatter means. And uh, if you do, if you've heard it before, type in the chat window there what you what the, the, the definition is or your understanding of what that word means. But um, generally, with smattering is a small amount of something, a superficial uh, knowledge of a language or subject often. So it's a small bit of something. And today I'm talking about word smatter. I'm going to talk, give you a smattering of words, and I'm going to use words to talk about words. Um, so today is all going to be about words, semantics. I'm going to talk about semantics and relate that to testers, and testers often deal with problems, and we'll talk about that. So the first half of this is going to be applicable to anybody that deals with uh, communication and uses words to communicate, which is pretty much everybody almost. And uh, the second half is really, again, going to be geared towards testers, using some of the things we learned in the first half, correlating them to the second half, and specifically what testers do and their roles and responsibilities. But that's not to say that others that are not testers will not get any value. Uh, one more note, uh, the way Hopin works is I've got my slides that you see up on this monitor so I can share it. This is my Hopin screen, which I'm about to alt tab away from so that I can see my speaker notes. So I will tab over to the uh, Hopin window occasionally and check the chat window to see if I missed anything, any questions or comments. <clears throat> uh, Dave, smatteringly familiar. I was an editor publisher for many years. Awesome. All right. So you are a wordsmith, a perhaps an armchair linguist like myself. So I'm interested in your feedback afterwards, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind. All right. So let's go. Uh, as is the fashion, the about me slide, a little bit about myself. My name is Damien Sandinos. These are ways to get a hold of me. The bottom left is only if you're in close proximity. Um, I'm a lot of things, as everybody is. Everyone's a lot of different things, a lot of different labels. Some of the labels that might be interesting and relevant to you here and now are, I'm a tester. Uh, I started testing in 1993 at CompuServe, a company that you may have read about in your history books, maybe. It was a way to get online before the internet proper was around. Uh, over the next 25 years, I spent testing at about 15 different companies, all in central Ohio, from finance and insurance. I was in retail. I was at an airline for eight years. I've done education. So I've been in a lot of different diverse contexts and industries and domains. And each of these companies, some were 30 employees, some were 30,000, some were global, some were local. I've worked as a full-time employee. I've worked as a consultant. I've worked in different methodologies from iterative and waterfall and V and spiral models. I've used tons of different tools and technologies to help me test better. And uh, so I got a lot of testing experience. The last eight years, I've helped organize the QA or the Highway conference. That's qaerthehighway.com. It's a regional testing conference in Columbus, Ohio. So I've got a lot of testing experience. Um, I'm also, I have an improv background. I've done improv for about 15 years. Like whose line is it anyway? Getting on stage, telling uh, impromptu made up stories to an audience, trying to connect with them. And I've taken my love, my, my creative side, my, I'm an artist, my improv experience. I created a children's book called Hank and Stella and Something from Nothing, which is teaching children life skills through improvisation. Uh, you can read the entire book online at hankandstellabooks.com. Um, so I'm a lot of things, tester, improviser. I'm an artist, an author, an illustrator. Uh, but one thing I'm not is a formally trained uh, linguist. I'm not a semanticist. I don't have any formal training. In fact, at 19 years old, when I started working at CompuServe, I dropped out of college. I don't even have a college degree. But uh, I have a love of language. Part of it uh, came from a life experience. About 15 years ago, I got married. Hooray. And about 10 months later, I got divorced. Ooh. 
And that's true, and it's unfortunate, but uh, I actually owe a lot of my current state and status to that life experience. It was very painful, and through uh, retrospection and introspection, I looked back and realized that a lot of the problem was caused by miscommunication. It wasn't dirty dishes and laundry and the small quibbles that we had. It was that we were not properly communicating, and that led to divorce. And so that was a very painful event. I decided if I wanted to avoid future divorce and future pain, maybe I should become a better communicator. So for the past 15 years or so, I've, becoming, I've been uh, learning to be a better communicator. And that includes learning about language and modeling and different communication, miscommunication, uh, information and, and semantics and linguistics. So while I'm not formally trained, I think that I've become a better communicator. One evidence is I'm married again. We have two kids and everything's going great. But uh, some of the things that I've learned personally, I realized that they not only helped me avoid future divorce and pain and my relationship with my wife and kids, but they also helped me become a better tester. And therefore, I think that some of the things I've learned might be valuable to you if you're in a similar enough context. So I don't know what an expert is. I've never put that label on myself, but these are some things that might help you possibly. I'll let you be the judge. Your talk yesterday, I'm flipping back over, Dave says, was about Agile Improv. Oh, well, we definitely got to talk. So you were a, an editor, publisher, and you have some improv chops. We definitely got to talk. It sounds like we have some common threads. All right, so moving on. The agenda, very high level. Purpose and expectation, start with the why. Uh, next, the first half of this is going to be a smattering of semantics, talking about some things that have helped me better understand the concept and idea of semantics. And after that, the second half will be talking about phrase deconstruction and analysis. I'm going to offer up a phrase I've heard very frequently in my testing career and use some ideas from semantics to help deconstruct it, and analyze it, and figure out what it might mean. All right, so what? Another way to say why. Who cares? So what, Damien? So why are you here? Um, again, for anybody online, uh, we have a handful of folks online. If you're interested, type in the chat window why you chose this session. Code Palooza has a lot of great speakers, a lot of great content. Why did you choose this particular session today? I'm interested. Um, there's no wrong answers. Your reason is your reason. Maybe you're in the wrong room. If so, that's fine. I'll see you later. But uh, I'm interested to find out why people came. I think if you understand why, the purpose, the goal, the reason that you do something, it better helps you uh, focus on what to do and then how to do it. But you have to start with the why. Simon Sinek, I think, is the most recent person to make this uh, idea popular. So I'm interested to hear your whys because me and use words. Nice, Dave. <laughs> All right. Uh, an expert, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I like your sense of humor, Dave, for sure. Uh, anyone else want to share their reason why you chose this? And if not, that's cool too. Eats, shoots, and leaves versus eats, comma, shoots, comma, and leaves. Yes, the old, uh, uh, what is it, koala bear walks into a bar, a famous joke in linguist circles. Um, you mentioned it yesterday in a previous session. It sounded interesting. Oh, hi, Jessica. Yes, I think that uh, I think you were in. I'm pretty sure you were in my session uh, uh, workshop. Yes, thank you. Great, learning about words. I'm interested in exploration. Great, exploration is a wonderful thing. That was you. Good, Jessica. My memory is not failing me completely. And you have and the title. Words matter. Is it so clever you couldn't resist? All right, good. You left you curious, left you wanting. Well, hopefully by the end, you're less curious, left, less wanted. You had me at pun. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's cruise. Uh, here's some reasons you might be here. Maybe some people decided to show up today because it's a primer on semantics. Uh, they read the abstract and they said, well, I'm interested. I know a little or nothing about semantics, so I'm interested in learning something more. And that's why I'm here. Maybe other people said, well, I don't care about semantics so much. I'm more interested in getting new and or different practical pragmatic insight into what this guy thinks the tester's role and responsibilities are. So those are great reasons. Uh, other people have listed some reasons as well in the chat window. Here's another reason that words matter. That's the pun, words matter. I think that words do matter. Uh, they're a primary way that we communicate ideas and thoughts. I have these ideas and thoughts in my head and these bubbles I want to get into your head. And one way of doing that is through words. And uh, I can't read your mind, you can't read mine, so I'm stuck with these crude tools, these words, and these hand gestures and facial expressions. And that's how I try and exchange and share my ideas with you. So words do matter. The words that we choose matter, and the study of semantics is all about that. So uh, uh, not only words matter in our personal life, but they help us professionally as testers. They help us talk about pragmatically about our work. They dispel 
uh, myths that might lead to bad practices. They're, they challenge our bad thinking. They help us understand ourselves and what we do better as testers or as BAs or developers, architects. They help shape practical testing into something more intellectual and academic and fun and engaging. Words are absolutely important. They help shape our feelings, our decisions, our culture. So I definitely think that words matter. So if, you, uh, if you're interested in words, or even if you're not, let's see, words are important. The tongue holds the power of life and death. That's got to be a quote from somebody. I haven't heard that one. I know a lot of quotes about language and, and words, but I haven't heard that one. That's an interesting one. So type in there who... Where, where you believe that quote came from. I'm always interested in quote origins too. So maybe you've heard or even said yourself, it's just semantics. I've certainly heard that phrase before in my life. It's just semantics. I'm debating or talking with somebody, chatting. And at some point, the debate or discussion or disagreement, somebody says, it's just semantics. Now, when I hear that, it could mean different things. Maybe they intended it to mean it's just a difference of words. It's only a difference of words, Damien. We're, we're sharing the same idea. You're using these words. I'm using those words. It's only a difference of words. So it's just semantic. But maybe some people say it's just semantics and they mean it's merely a minor difference. It's, it's actually not just the words are different, but our ideas are slightly off. The railroad tracks are not quite meeting. Or perhaps when somebody says it's just semantics, they're saying it's a fundamental difference. Uh, not only the words are different and the ideas are vastly different, drastically different. It's a very semantic difference, fundamental Damien. But in my personal experience, when I hear someone say it's just semantics in the middle of a debate or discussion, most often what I think they're actually trying to say is, shut up, this conversation is over. Now, that's my personal opinion. That's my experience. Oftentimes, I see it's just semantics as a bullying tactic. It's a way to stifle conversation, to shut down debate and ideas. It's a way that people use to end conversation. And that's unfortunate because I think that semantics is very important. So what exactly is semantics? Semantics comes from the Greek word meaning semantikos, which means significant. And I think that that itself is significant, that the word semantics originally meant significant in the Greek language. Now, semantics has different definitions. Uh, most of the definitions in today's uh, presentation and this talk come from myself. I do a lot of research and I compare definitions across sources, different dictionaries different blogs, different articles. I ask people, what's your definition of this word? And I concoct my own definition. And uh, that's mostly what I'm going to present today. So a reasonable definition of semantics is the meaning of a word, phrase, sentence, or text. Now, as someone that's interested in words, when I uh, started asking people and talking to people and looking up definitions of semantics and dictionaries, I realized that I had seen this definition before. It was very uh, similar to another word, definition. A definition of definition is a statement of the exact meaning of a word. Well, that's pretty similar to the definition of semantics, the meaning of a word, phrase, sentence, or text, a statement of the exact meaning of a word. And both of those are similar to meaning. A definition of meaning is what is meant by a word, a concept, or action. So very literally, if somebody says it's just semantics, they, mean, they may mean one of those four things, but literally they could be saying it's just definitions or it's just meaning. So if we're having a debate, a discussion, and somebody says, Damien, hang on, it's just semantics. If I'm taking the, their, their words literally, I'll say, well, you're talking about meaning. You're talking about definitions. And in that case, it's very significant. I think this is important that we come to an agreement over this, or at least an understanding. Now, a lot of people don't like semantic discussions, but in fact, they've probably been having their entire, their entire lives. I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, and I know that my kids, we're constantly having semantic discussions, even though they don't realize it. Um, I tell my kids, you're adorable, and they don't know the word adorable, so they say, Daddy, what do you mean? That is semantics. They're asking about meaning. What does the word mean? Or sometimes they say, it's frustrating. Kids, it's time for bed, and they say, what do you mean? They know time for bed. They know, but that is a semantic discussion. They're trying to find out what I mean, and they're pushing me. Sometimes they say things to me. They, Daddy, when is the banana? And I have no idea what that means, so I say, what do you mean? These are all semantic discussions. So if you have kids, you're constantly having semantic discussions. But even if you don't have children, adults don't stop this. If you've ever asked, what does it mean? Or someone's ever asked you, what does it mean? The response entered you into a semantic discussion. In fact, I sometimes like to tease people that say, well, semantics isn't important and I really avoid semantic discussions. I hate them. And I say, well, what do you mean by that? If they answer me, they are unknowingly having a semantic discussion. They are giving me the meaning of their words. So it happens all the time to everyone everywhere. So 
let's talk about a smattering of semantics. Here's some things that I have come across in my studies and research and learning and self-improvement that have helped me better understand semantics, and hopefully they help you as well. Let me jump over to the chat window here. All right, Dave, you're typing a lot here. I really love it, and I, I'm going to save all this for uh, analysis later. But let me, Bible, Book of Proverbs. Oh, that's where that pro, uh, quote came from. Cool. Also, it includes antics, so prepare for mischief. Okay, I can tell. The definition of what it is, the meaning of what you intend, the semantics is the way you say it. Ah, I see. So there's a nuance to you about the difference between definition and meaning and semantics. Okay. That's interesting. Meaning is what you intend. And the semantics is one way you say it. I won't disagree and I won't agree. I think that that's a very interesting take on it. Um, one of the interesting things to me about uh, uh, definitions and meaning is uh, why are there different definitions? I mean, different dictionaries. It's because there's a group of editors somewhere in Cambridge or America or different places in the world that are coming to some agreement about what this word means. And sometimes they look at the origin, the etymology of the word and the the evolution of the word and words that are become obsolete. But if there was truly only one definition of a word or a word only meant one thing, there'd really only be need, uh, we'd only need one dictionary. Um, one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, Paul Watzlawick, I believe it is. And he says, a definition of dictionary is truth expressed in alphabetical order, or I'm sorry, opinion expressed, expressed as truth in alphabetical order. I really like that. It reminds me that there's no objective definitions. They're all subjective and influenced by culture and perspective. And we're gonna talk about a lot of those things today. All right, so uh, first box is metaphor. I'm gonna talk about that and how it helps me better understand uh, the relationship between words and meaning and communication. Next is Humpty Dumpty. Uh, what can we learn about semantics from that? Next is after that is disputed words. What words are disputed and why? And then same but different, what does that mean? I'll go through briefly the life of a word, introduce you to some strange creatures, and talk about the name is not the thing and how all those things relate to semantics, words, and language, and understanding. So first, the box is metaphor. I learned this from a book called Metaphors We Live By, and sometimes I like to visualize things, um, uh, draw things, look at diagrams, make them visual, uh, visualizations to help me better understand. And this was a visualization that really helped me understand things. So if I imagine every single word as a box and the contents of that box is the meaning or definition of the word, it might look something like this. Here's the word definition represented as a box. So what does definition mean? Well, I already gave you the definition of definition earlier. Very roughly, it is with the articles and the small words taken out. It's the statement of the exact meaning of a word. So if you open up the box definition, out spills the definition of definition, this particular word, the meaning of it. Well, you can express those as words themselves, and each word is its own box. So let's open up the next box. If you open up the box word, a reasonable definition of word is a single distinct meaningful element of speech. And each of those can be expressed as words. So continue this process. Open up the box meaningful. What does that mean? The definition for meaningful is simply having meaning. And very quickly, you start to see that there's some recursion going on. The word meaning has already been used before. We just didn't open up that box yet. But every time I say a word, it is packed with meaning, and that meaning can be expressed with words, which themselves is packed with meaning and expressed with words, and on and on infinitely. So it's amazing. If I say something simple like cow or table or, or sunshine, these words have infinite meaning, packed and packed and packed in meaning. And I hope that the boxes that I'm unpacking in my brain and my mental model are the same as yours, because if they're not, we might be miscommunicating but not even realizing it. One of my favorite quotes from uh, about communication comes from George Bernard Shaw. And he says, the greatest enemy to communication is the illusion that it has taken place. I love that because very often people will walk out of a meeting and say, what a great meeting, what a great talk, what a great conversation. And in fact, they had been talking past one another the entire time, but they never realized it. It's the illusion that communication had taken place. So sometimes if I'm saying words, as simple as a word like cow is, cow it implies that my definition of cow is the same as yours and all the words that are used in the definition of cow are the same as yours and on and on. Sometimes I think it's miraculous that anyone can communicate with anyone else ever using words. So communication is tough. And why is it tough? Let's look at Humpty Dumpty. This story comes from uh, Through the Looking Glass, 1871 from Lewis Carroll. And in this particular passage, Alice, the character, is talking to Humpty, the egg character up on the wall. And they're talking about unbirthdays, a term that was created by Lewis Carroll. 
and um, they're every day of the birthday, every day of the year that is not your birthday is your unbirthday. So here's how this passage goes. Um, Humpty says, there's only one day for birthday presents, you know. And then he says, there's glory for you. Alice pauses. She says, I don't know what you mean by glory. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, until I tell you. I meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you. Alice said, but glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. Um, Humpty said in a rather scornful tone, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Now, this is a very interesting uh, passage and a very interesting uh, section, especially for people interested in language and linguists. And it's because it talks about the unspoken, unspoken, unwritten contract that is written between players, between people communicating. It basically says that communicating involves an unspoken, unwritten contract, that the words that we use mean roughly what they're supposed to mean. Now, in this case, Humpty used the word glory in a very unorthodox manner. He said, there's glory for you. Now, Alice could have just scratched her head and said, well, that seems odd. I don't quite understand what he means, but that said anything, not object. But she did object. She challenged him and said, wait a second, what do you mean by this? And when Humpty explained himself, what he did was gave a very unorthodox, uncommon definition for the word glory. And Alice said, well, that doesn't make much sense to me. But by challenging him and asking for clarification, what she actually did was uh, achieved understanding. Now, she may disagree and say glory does not mean what you said it means. But she now understands that when he says glory, he means a nice knockdown argument. So while there still might be disagreement, this type of challenge helps understanding. It helps foster effective communication. Um, Lewis Carroll also went on to say in Symbolic Logic, he said that I maintain that any writer of a book is fully authorized in attaching any meaning he likes to any word he intends to use. If I find an author saying at the beginning of his book, let it be understood that by the word white, I shall mean black, and by black, I shall mean white. Then I, the reader, must meekly accept his ruling, however injudicious I think it may be. So as long as someone is upfront about what they mean by words, as long as they're clear and transparent, like an author saying, when I say white, I'm going to be black, and black, and I'm going to be white in this book, for the context and bounds of that book, you understand what the author is saying. Even if you think it's stupid, you understand what they're saying. But what happens if you start to stray too far from the common meaning of a word and no one challenges you, miscommunication can happen. Now, if you're familiar with the comic XKCD written by Man Randall Monroe, it's an internet comic, I love it, xkcd.com. This is his take on it. It's the same scene from the same book. Humpty says, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Alice says, I wonder what all those words you said just meant. Maybe you're telling me I can have all your stuff? And Humpty says, wait, wait, no, 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 no. She says, oh, your car too, thanks. So she's taken this stupid game that he's playing and turned it in her favor. And she's actually saying, oh, well, if words can mean anything, then I'm just going to assume that everything you're saying means you're giving me your, your uh, material possessions. So it's very dangerous. If you don't challenge words, you can get into this uh, area where you miscommunication is happening. So sometimes challenging, disputing a word is important. Let's talk about disputed words. Uh, I'll give some examples, and that'll help you better understand what I mean by this. Fewer and less. Let me go over to the window here. All right, still good. Fewer and less. Uh, oftentimes people use these as synonyms. They mean roughly the same thing and they're interchangeable. You can say fewer or less in the middle of a sentence if you mean some amount that's smaller than uh, some other amount. So what's the big deal? Well, some people may dispute that and say, actually, there is a difference. That uh, fewer is for those types of things that you can practically count. You can assign numbers to them. Less, on the other hand, is for things that you cannot practically count. For example, fewer people, you can count the number of people, have less patience. You can't really count patience. It's an abstract construct for discussing semantics. I find that to be true. Now, some people may say at a grocery store, wait a second, that, uh, that sign above the, the uh, checkout line says 10 items or less, when it should say 10 items or fewer. But I would argue that did you understand the intent of the sign? Were you completely lost and you thought it was a sign pointing to the bathroom? Well, no, I understood they meant I can have 10 items or nine or eight or seven, all the way down to zero items, I suppose. I said, so even though they used the wrong word, communication happened. You didn't use the word glory to mean knock down argument. They used the word less when it should have been fewer, but it was close enough that the unwritten, unspoken contract between the players, between the grocery store and yourself was not unbroken. They didn't stray far enough from the meaning. Let's look at another one. Expect and anticipate, very similar, sometimes used as synonyms, but there is a distinct difference. Some pedants may point out that uh, 
uh, expectation is um, regarding is likely to happen, while anticipate is the same thing, but also taking action. So for example, she anticipated a difficult test and therefore she studied hard. Whereas expected might be she expected a, a high grade and why? Well, because she studied hard. Now, again, if you use those words and interchange them and switch them around, will people still understand what you mean? Probably if used in the proper context and the meaning of and your intent is close enough. But what if we're talking about unbirthdays and I say, well, there's only one day for birthdays. There's anticipation for you. Then Alice might say, wait, wait, wait. That doesn't mean, what does it mean by when anticipation? Here's some other disputed words. Some words sometimes that are very controversial. Literally, literally, I laughed my head off. You know, so many people have used literally to mean figuratively. Many dictionaries are adding additional definitions to their corpus, to their dictionary definition that now it says literally means something that is actual and exact and precisely as is. And a secondary definition say says that literal is mean to use not literal. It's to use to meant figurative, which is crazy. But we'll talk later about how words evolve because of common usage. Ironically, I think that Alanis Morissette ruined the meaning of this one. She had a song with a lot of things that were coincidental, coincidental or unfortunate, but not necessarily ironic. So people disputed her use of the word ironic. And resources. This is one in tech and testing I've come across. People frequently complain about uh, being called a resource. They say, don't call me a resource. I'm not. I'm a human being, not a resource. Well, dictionary definitions uh, from different sources. Talk about resources being something that's a source of help, a source of information, a source of strength. Another definition is a stock of reserves. It could be money, materials, people, or some other asset that can be drawn on when needed. With those definitions, I like to be thought of as a resource. Yes, I'm a source of, a source of strength that I can be drawn on when needed. That seems okay to me. However, I also understand that other people may not have this uh, this understanding and this dictionary definition in their pocket, and they may have some negative connotations associated with it. And I'm sensitive to that, so therefore I'm sensitive with using that word around others, because not everyone has the same understanding and same uh, same understanding or same meaning of that word. Words and meaning are very subjective. Finally, done, finished, complete. This is something I've encountered again in my career. I come across different companies where they have different definitions for done or finished, complete. Um, a wonderful story is I started at a company and during the onboarding process, I had all sorts of things I had to read. And in one of the manuals was a glossary, a glossary of company terms, uh, jargon and acronyms that they used within the walls of that company. It didn't mean much outside of that company, but if I was going to communicate with my fellow employees at this company, I should understand this glossary of terms and, def and def associated definitions. So as I was reading down through it, I thought that was a great idea, someone that's interested in language. I came across their definition of done. Here's what done, done may have a definition in the dictionary, but here's what it means at our company, okay? After that, they had a term called done, done, done dash done. And it had a different definition. I thought, okay, I get it. So something's done or done, done, okay? Two different things. They had a third term, done, done, done. And this is where I started to laugh. I thought, what on earth are they doing? This is insane. But then on retrospect, I thought about it and it's brilliant because although they had three silly like terms, done, 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 and all three of them had different definitions, to people outside like myself, it looks silly. But to people inside, they were able to communicate very efficiently, very effectively without any miscommunication, without any uh, um, any problems. And somebody could say, hey, what's the, what's the uh, status of that task? Somebody could say, well, it's done, done, but it's not done, done, done. And the other person would say, got it, understand. So sometimes creating a lingua franca or a shared language, a common language among people in the same context, whether that be your team, your department, your company, can be very helpful and help uh, communication. One other term that is very interesting is for me as a tester is best practice. And I wanna do a quick aside to talk about this. This is a term that is very disputed. Uh, oftentimes I see it in different social media, LinkedIn and Twitter, people are saying, there's no such thing as best practices. And people are saying, oh, best practice here and there. So I wanna talk about it a little further. This is a picture of my daughter and this is uh, us on a daddy daughter date one time. And we were out and about driving around town and she said to me in the car, she was talking about her two friends and she said this sentence. She said, daddy, Stella is my best friend and Avery is my best friend. And I laughed and I said, oh, sweetheart, there can only be one best you fool. No, I didn't say that. But I was curious because she used the word best, which is the top, the utmost of some category, the, the number one spot. So I said, you can't have two best friends. What does she mean by this? So just like Alice did with Humpty Dumpty, 
I challenged her word and I asked for clarification. I said, honey, what do you mean by best? He said, Stella's your best friend and Avery's your best friend. What do you mean? She said, you know, daddy, I mean, Stella's my really good friend and Avery's my really good friend. Ah, okay. So she did not prescribe to the dictionary definition of best. And I might disagree with her definition. Best doesn't just mean really good. But I now understand when she says best, perhaps she doesn't mean the top of some particular set. Maybe she just means really, really good as an emphasis. So what does best mean? A dictionary definition is that which is the most excellent, the outstanding, something that's outstanding or desirable. What is the definition of practice? The actual application or use of an idea, belief, or, belief or method. Sometimes you can just take two definitions and smash them together. And if I do that, best practice becomes the most excellent, outstanding, or desirable application of a use, or use of an idea, belief, or method. But that's not always the way that terms, especially multi-word terms, get their definitions. You don't just smash two other definitions of each individual word together. This is why idioms exist. Idioms are colloquialisms, things, sentences that um, have, each word has an understood individual meaning, but collectively put together, they have a completely different meaning. Things like kick the can. A foreigner may understand the word kick, and the foreigner may understand the word can, and someone that does not have English as a first language would say kick with your leg and can, a, a container, but they don't understand that kick the can is an idiom that means to die. So sometimes, uh, collectively, words together have different meanings. So the collective meaning of best practice, which is a term in itself, is a procedure that's accepted or prescribed as being correct or most effective. That's pretty similar to the mashup definition. But I was interested. Let's go a little deeper into what best practice might actually mean. When somebody says best or best practice, I think they might be using it in a few different ways. Uh, the first is if somebody says best, maybe they're using it subjectively, like uh, this is the best soup. Oh, I had this soup. It's the best. Now, I'm not going to mistake that they've had every soup in the entire world, and therefore they are the expert on all soups, and this is absolutely the best soup in the entire world since they've had them all. I understand that they're using it subjectively. What they mean, it's a, it's a really good soup to them. Perhaps somebody's saying best, like uh, the best best runner, and it implies some particular context that they have just not made explicit. They haven't stated it. So if uh, somebody wins a marathon, the, the announcers may be talking about the winner of the race, the champion, the best runner, without saying the best runner at this race, on this day, at this time, with this set of people. Those are all implied things. But if you were to dig, they would say, yes, yes, I didn't mean the best runner in history or the best runner of uh, marathons in other cities. I meant the best runner in this particular race. It was just implied. But you can dig deeper and find out that context if you if you're, think they might be using best in a literal meaning. And finally, world's best boss. Well, this is as hyperbole. I don't really think that they have the best boss in the world. They're just saying that my boss is really good in the same way that my daughter talked about her friends. They're using it to express emotions as emphasis. So when I hear best practice, I wonder if someone's meaning that my subjective opinion is that this practice is best. That's what I think, it's my opinion. Or if they say best practice, maybe they mean this is the best practice at my company, on this team, at this time, based on all the things that we know for this circumstance, but I just didn't bother saying all those implied things. Or perhaps they mean this practice is really, really great. It's the best practice. It's just an emphasis to say how great they think this practice is. So I love that uh, if you've ever seen Napoleon Dynamite, there's a wonderful scene in it where they're watching a little video clip and Napoleon Dynamite, the lead character, says, this is pretty much the worst video ever made. And his brother says, Napoleon, like anyone can even know that. Now, Napoleon probably intended and said worst video to express some subjective opinion about the video or maybe as hyperbole to exaggerate his meaning about how bad he thought it was. But his brother Kip took it as literal and said, you could not have seen every video ever made to determine that this is the worst. So I'd like to remember that video every time I'm considering the term best practice. And what does all this matter? Because disputed words, people will sometimes dispute the meaning of a word and pull out the dictionary and say, that's not the dictionary definition. And there's grammar Nazis and there's pedants, but you have to be careful that are you uh, miscommunicating? If the communication is still effective and efficient, then is there really any reason to dispute the word? All right. Oh, there's so many comments I'm missing out here. I'm sorry because I can't see both screens at the same time. Let me read through some of these. Uh, many contentious discussions about the constitutionalism, textualism. Who I got to dig into that one. Ironic, fairness. Oh, isn't ironic? Rolled off the tongue better than the initial version of the song. <laughs> Thank you, Brendan. 
the door as the stars fall from the sky. All right, I can't wait to read done or done done or done done done. Yeah, uh, well, in this particular company, what looks to an outsider as a ridiculous term or silly language inside the company makes complete sense. And I think that they understand that um, if they take it back to their spouses or significant others or tell their friends and family outside the company about things, something being done, 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 they're going to think they're crazy. But within that context, it makes complete sense. It fosters understanding and communication. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. And in fact, I wrote a blog post about this very topic, dun, dun, dun. And I used the, uh, is it the uh, surprised, surprised gopher meme with the dun, dun, dun. Uh, we can all thank the office for providing us an ironic meaning for that best boss mug. <laughs> yes. And uh, grammar, please. I just saw a great video today about grammar Nazis. Very amusing. If you correct and serve. Nice. <laughs> All right, moving on. So disputing words. What about let's that segues into this next topic. Uh, same but different. What does that mean? Uh, it's another way of saying distinction without a difference. It's an artificially created uh, distinction where no meaningful distinction exists. To explain this further, I'll give you an example from a movie. This is Crocodile Dundee, 1986 movie. And in the movie, he's walking down the street with his companion and they get stopped by a mugger. The mugger, mugger brandishes a knife and says, give me all your money. Crocodile Dundee laughs. He pulls out a bigger knife and says, that's not a knife, that's a knife, and holds up his knife. And the mugger gets scared, runs away, and the croc saves the day. So funny little scene in the movie. But what is going on in this scene? Is, is the, did the writer and director of this particular scene, were they trying to show that the hero of the movie, Crocodile Dundee, is blind and he can't see knives? Or he's an idiot and he thinks that the mugger was holding up a banana and he's too stupid to realize a knife when he sees one. No, what they're probably trying to show is that he recognizes that hits a knife, but he's pointing out a distinction where no real distinction actually exists. Why? That's the curious part. When somebody points out a distinction without a difference, if there's no real difference, then what is the purpose of the distinction? Maybe they have, they're trying to raise or lower their status, which I think is what was happening in this scene. Crocodile Dundee was trying to intimidate the mugger by lowering the mugger's status and raising his own through words by saying, that's not a knife, this knife is much bigger. This is a knife. But that's the reason. He didn't recognize that that was not a knife. He recognized it's a knife. He was trying to raise his status. Sometimes people use a distinction without a difference as political commentary or social commentary or cultural commentary. Sometimes they're trying to advance some particular agenda. You have to figure out why are people making this distinction if there's no real meaningful difference. Think about a story where a cop pulls someone over and they say, sir, have you been drinking any alcohol? And the driver says, nope, no alcohol, just beer. Well, that's a distinction without a difference. And the cop says, sir, please step out of the car. The guy says, car? This is no car. This is a Ferrari. A distinction without a difference. Why is he saying that? He wants to raise his status. This isn't just any car. It's a Ferrari. And the cop says, sir, I, I think you've been lying to me. And the guy says, I'm not lying. These are just alternative facts, which, again, is a phrase that we've probably heard in recent times. These are ways of what, one from our context is probably like, hey, I found a defect. And the other person says, it's no defect. It's a feature. Well, if somebody is making a distinction that there's no real difference, why is it? If somebody's saying that's a feature and not a bug, maybe they're just trying to avoid work of, of coding a fix. So whenever you hear this, now you should be more aware and attuned to it. Well, what's going on? Dig down and find out why are they making this distinction if there's no real difference. Life of a word, very quickly. Words live, they're born, they live for a while, they evolve and they die. A neologism is a newly coined word or expression, one that's just entering the common usage of a uh, culture. Uh, protologism logism is a word uh, that is brand new, uh, even newer than a neologism. And this happens all the time. New words come into existence. Some examples are unbirthday. That was from Lewis Carroll uh, through the looking glass. I talked about that. Noob. This is uh, coined around the early 2000s, something that's new to the Internet. Truthiness. Again, in mid-2000s, it has a truthy feel to it, even though it's not totally true. Neuroplasticity, the ability of our minds to uh, shape and mold to different thoughts and memories, that's only from the 1890s. Sometimes existing words are repurposed. Google and spam used to mean a big number or meat, and now they are a company or even a verb. Google that. Or spam is now unwanted uh, email. Cloud, not something in the sky, but now it's also someone else's computer. And ask. Ask is a, a clearly an old word, but as a noun, it has actually, people say, oh, I hate ask as a noun. It's actually been used as a noun for hundreds of years, but putting a modifier in front of it, like a big ask, is only since the 80s. So sometimes old words are repurposed or modified for a new purpose. 
Sometimes words can not only be modified, but they mean the opposite of what they used to mean. Bully used to mean a stand-up, wholesome guy, and now it means a, a, a horrible person, somebody that intimidates you or harms you. Awesome used to mean something that causes terror or dread, and now it's something that's remarkable or exciting. And awful is the opposite. Awful used to mean something that was inspiring all, and now it means something that's bad or unpleasant. So sometimes meanings actually flip. Brunch, spork, sometimes people concatenate words. Uh, portmanteau is one term for that, or mashup. They mash up two different words that existed before, and the new word has a completely different meaning. Brunch is a combination of breakfast and lunch. New word didn't exist before, and now it has a new meaning attached to it. And finally, sometimes words are retired or they die. Fudgel is uh, pretending to work but not really doing anything. I've seen that in my career. Gravel is arguing about nothing, which is sometimes what semantic arguments become, it seems like. And apricity, the warmness of uh, sun in the winter. So words that no longer exist, so they've died and, uh, and their meaning has gone away. So talking about words, why does this matter? Because when somebody says, well, I'm disputing this word or I'm bringing up a distinction that's no real difference, and they pull out their dictionaries and they try and point to what the definition is. Understand that words like literally can actually change to the opposite meaning. Words evolve, they're born, they die. And so, and it's very subjective. It's very much a matter of opinion, regardless of what a dictionary says. And if you're interested in seeking a communication and understanding, that's important to understand. Strange creatures, I'll quickly introduce you to a couple uh, and hopefully that'll help you better understand um, some more about semantics. The first one's called a tardigrade, a water bear, a moss piglet. The second creature, I'm not going to read all that, but there's a lot of information about it. If you're reading through it, uh, normally what I do at this point is ask folks, you've just learned about two different creatures. Which one do you feel you know more about? And undoubtedly, people will respond that they know more about the second creature. And then I challenge them. I say, how could you know about the second creature if you don't even know its name? Now, sometimes people do recognize this creature and they know the name. But for those that don't, you don't even know the name of this thing. How could you possibly claim to know more? This slide was inspired by uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist. He has a, a short talk called The Difference Between Knowing Something and Knowing the Name of Something. And even in my own life, I've encountered uh, this before. I was a leader of a test team, and I asked a team member when we got a new build to go do uh, some regression testing. We got a new build, go run the regression tests. And they came back very quickly and said, done. I thought, wow, they're fast. How did they run all of our tests that quickly? And then, um, the next build came around and again, I asked them, please go run the regression test. And they came back very, almost too quickly, you know, several hours later and said, I'm done running the regression tests and here's the results. And I went, that's amazing. I've never seen someone work so fast. Then the third time we got the build and I was about to ask them to run the regression test. I said, hang on a second. I'd like you to run the regression test, but what are regression tests exactly? And they said, well, you know, we have those thousands of tests that we run, you know, on a build. And I said, sure. Yeah. They said, well, I select a few of those tests that test only the important functionality just to make sure that the basics work. Went, oh, my gosh. Well, what you've just described, that concept, is what I understand to be sanity testing or smoke testing. So the idea that you described, I have a different name for it, a different label. So every time I told her to go do regression testing, she was doing something that I call smoke testing or sanity testing, which takes far less time, which is why they were coming back so quickly. So it wasn't until I finally challenged and this was what uh, George Bernard Shaw was saying. We thought we were communicating, but we weren't at all. And it wasn't until I challenged their meaning that I discovered that this communication had been taking place. So not to leave you hanging, this is what a tardigrade is, a fascinating little animal, actually visible to the naked eye. It's very small, but it's very robust in this extremophile. And I don't want to leave you hanging on the second one. This is the name of the second one. I'll give you a second to read that before I tell you how it's pronounced. That is pronounced gooey duck. Now, if you've never seen that word or, the, or that name before, you might have pronounced it geoduck, which seems logical. But this is a word that actually has a different pronunciation than how it's spelled, kind of like kernel or February. Uh, it comes from the Lushosit uh, Lusho language of an American Indian tribe, and it was originally pronounced guiduck. And somewhere along the evolution of the decades and centuries, the spelling got changed, but the pronunciation stayed the same. So that's sometimes a curiosity of language. Finally, the name is not the thing. From Romeo and Juliet, uh, Juliet laments that what's in a name, that which we call a rose by, by any other name would smell just as sweet. And that's true. The name of something does not change its attributes, its properties. But what it does change is your perception, your feeling about that thing. For instance, what if instead of a rose, we called it a stink blossom? Well, does that change the smell of the rose? Would it still smell as sweet? Yes, but would it be as nice to get a stink blossom as a present? What if we called it a phlegm flower? 
But if you bought your significant other a bouquet of phlegm flowers, again, it doesn't change the physical attributes or properties of the rose, but someone getting a bunch of phlegm flowers that has its own meaning might make them perceive it differently. So again, words matter. They affect our feelings and our perceptions about things. So another way of understanding the name is not the thing is remembering the map is not the territory. The menu is not the meal. The model is not the thing that is being modeled. The test plan is not the plan for testing. The test strategy is not the strategy for testing. This is all reification is the technical term for this. Mistaking, uh, putting physical properties on the abstract idea and treating it as if it were a physical thing. So remember that the name is not the thing, although it can affect our perceptions, it doesn't actually uh, affect the thing itself. So in summary, there's a few different uh, things that might help you better understand uh, semantics. The boxes metaphor helps you visualize it. Humpty Dumpty, and when do you uh, stray too far from the common meaning of a word, you might be breaking that unspoken contract. Disputed words, uh, some words are disputed even though they may be uh, near synonyms. Same but different, that's the distinction without a difference. Why are they doing that? There must be some reason for that distinction with, for a, without a difference. The life of a word. Words are born, they live, they die, and they're constantly evolving. So keep that in mind when you're speaking with people. Strange creatures. If you understand the concept, it's not as important to understand the name. And finally, the name is not the thing. Just another reminder that uh, abstract concepts are more important than the name because they don't actually change the attributes, but they can change your perception. So I'm going to really go fast here for this last bit. This is a phrase that I've heard many times in my career. Testers and variations of it. Do or don't help prevent or detect problems. Um, <laughs> stop praying. Um, this is a, the most common version I've heard of this particular phrase is testers don't, uh, don't prevent problems. Testers just detect problems. That's what a tester does. They find them. They don't help stop them. They don't prevent them. So this is a phrase that uh, I've heard many different variations and uh, I, I challenge it when I hear it now. And, and I'm going to walk backwards through this. I'm going to start at the back and go forwards. First is a problem. What is it? One definition is a matter or situation regarded as unwelcome or harmful, needing to be dealt with and overcome. It's also Jerry Weinberg, late great Jerry Weinberg, said it's a difference between things as desired and things as perceived. So a few different definitions here in technology. We usually often refer to problems as bugs. It's an error in a computer program or a system. Sometimes Brett Petticord, the tester, said it's anything that bugs someone, a very short, pithy definition. I like that. But we also refer to problems and bugs by many other names. Defects and issues and failures and glitches and errors and exceptions and slip ups and blunders and oversights. These are all different words that roughly mean the same thing as problem. So why does it matter? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. While it doesn't change the qualities and properties of the actual problem itself, it can change someone's perception and emotional response to that. Imagine going to a developer and telling them that I found an issue with your code as a tester or going to a developer and saying, I found a blunder with your code. The word itself can make the developer respond differently emotionally and have a different perception of your information that you're presenting to them. So remember that words matter because they can make us feel differently. There also might be legal ramifications. If your company has a contract with a client that says, we'll deliver software with no more than three defects, and you deliver the software and the client comes back and says, we found five defects, maybe you could say, well, there was three defects and two glitches. So the other two, we have a different definition for glitch and therefore it doesn't break the contract. So there may be legal ramifications. Uh, another idea around problems is relativism. This is a pretty big philosophical idea to relate to problems, but I'm going to try and connect these. And roughly, it's the doctrine that knowledge and truth and morality, they're all in relation. They're all relative, subjective, uh, and they're not absolute. Michael Bolton, uh, the tester from Rapid Software Testing, created the relative rule. He says that for any abstract X, X is X to some person at some time. That's based on the Jerry Weinberg definition of quality. Quality is value to someone at some time. Well, I've restated the relative rule as this. Relative rule describes the relationship between someone, that's who, and something, what, and, and some time, when. So I will give a definition or an example of this to make it a little bit more clear. This is a teddy bear, of course. Now to you and I, it's just a teddy bear, but this is Joe, and baby Joe is not just any teddy bear, it's Mr. Snuggles, and Joe loves Mr. Snuggles. He really loves it a lot. Well, this is Joe, baby Joe's baby friend, Davy Jane, and Jane knows about the bear, but it's not Mr. Snuggles to her, it's just some bear, so Jane is rather indifferent to it. So this is a description or an explanation that sometimes if you change the who, the relationship, the liking of something changes. In this case, uh, Joe likes the bear a lot, while Jane is rather indifferent to it. We're talking about how much somebody likes or appreciates or loves something in this case. 
continuing. This is a blanket. It's a blanket to you and me. And certainly it's no blanket to just Jane. Jane loves it. It's her soft little cuddly blanket. But to Joe, it's just another blanket. So sometimes if you change the what, it can change the relationship. And finally, here's baby Jane all grown up, adult Jane. Well, she still knows about the bear and she's still indifferent to it. But now as an adult, she doesn't have the same feelings about the blanket that she did as a child. So she's indifferent to the blanket. So sometimes changing the when, the time, can change someone's relationship to something. Now let's replace this with something that's more relevant to us. How about a bug, a problem, a defect, a glitch? This is a bug that happens when you're trying to purchase something online at a website. You've filled out your order form. You put in your address and credit card information. You click purchase. And instead of buying the thing, you get this bug. Well, baby Joe doesn't care about it. He's not buying things online. And baby Jane doesn't care about it. But adult Jane, it makes her angry. It bugs her. So that's an example of how relativism is related to problems. So what? So what we call problems, the words or labels that we put on them might matter. It might cause people to react differently emotionally, and there might even be legal ramifications. Also, remember that what problems are relative. They're subjective to someone at some particular time. You change the problem or the person or the time, and it can change the relation to that problem. Well, one man's trash is another man's treasure is a simple way of saying that. Moving on, prevent and detect. A simple definition of prevent is to keep something from happening or arising. A simple definition of detect is discover or identify the presence or existence of. Now, something I do before every time I give this talk is I look up headlines. I go to Google and I go to the news and I look up headlines that contain the word detect and prevent. And here's a few that I found that have the word detect. China launches a coronavirus app to detect whether users have come in close contact with the sick. Or new video tech will help Minnesota police detect suspects. Or can AI detect fake news? Now, just reading the headlines alone, and sometimes I read a little bit of the article, here's how these headlines make me feel. Yeah. Okay. That's great. They have a new app that can detect whether I came in close contact with the risk. Not prevent, not tell me you're about to. You're about to go somewhere where there's a lot of sick people there. Don't go there. And the video tech will help the police detect suspects. In fact, if you read the article, it talks about the police chief says that he believes that this new technology will help solve cases going forward. Not prevent them, but solve them. Yeah, okay, I guess that's nice. So let's compare that against headlines that have the word prevent. Installation of technology to prevent rail crashes nears completion. San Antonio firefighters prevent a fire from spreading to the university hospital. Or what steps can you take to prevent identity theft? From the headline and the word prevent alone, these make me feel a little better. Now, to prevent something, you usually have to detect that it exists first, and then you can prevent it. But, for example, in the second one, the second headline, they talk about a fire at a construction site outside of a university hospital. It caused a scare, but the firefighters managed to keep it from spreading. They prevented it from spreading. That's a wonderful story. They didn't just detect it and go, well, good luck. So just the words, again, can have different emotional uh responses from people that read it, detect versus prevent. And that's important. If people are saying testers do or don't help prevent or detect problems, those words can evoke different emotions and perceptions from people. Let's dig a little deeper into preventing and detecting. Causality, another very philosophical, heady concept. Roughly, it's the relationship between cause and effect. So I'll give you an example by walking you through a story that we've already started here. There's our bug. And this story should help you understand why I think causality is important to this particular phrase and idea. Prevent or detect. There's our bug. When you go to purchase something, it doesn't purchase it. It throws up an error on the website. We already know that it makes adult Jane angry. We've already said that this cause leads to this effect. But if you're familiar with causality, you know that there's always a many-to-many -many relationship. Many causes, whether made explicit or known or unknown, lead to many effects, known and unknown. So this particular simplistic story, this bug, uh, this single cause, has two effects. It makes Jane angry, which we've already established, and it also makes the company lose money. Because instead of them selling a product and making money, they're unable to sell anything because people are getting an error instead. So there's two causes. So let's go backwards in time. Why did this bug happen? Well, if you go backwards in time, you dig down and you find out, you do some root cause analysis, you find out there was an extra semicolon in the code. And it, combined, it compiled just fine, it was pushed out to production, it was missed in testing perhaps, um, and that's what caused the bug, a little extra semicolon. Well, why was the semicolon in there in the first place? There's Joe, remember baby Joe, he's all grown up, now he's a developer and he's the best one in the department, he's great, usually on top of his game, but today he was so tired, so tired that he was not focused and he was too tired and he hit an extra semicolon and he checked the code into the main branch and it compiled just fine and they pushed it out to production and 
Jane went to order something and instead she got a bug and an error and a problem and lost the company money. So why was Joe tired? Well, a dog was up barking all night long and poor Joe couldn't get any sleep and therefore he was tired. He hit sex with semicolon, which caused the bug, which made Jane angry and the company lost money. Now again, causality, sometimes multiple causes lead to multiple effects. In this case, multiple causes. Why was that dog barking? It was very cold out that night and this poor dog didn't have a dog house. So the combination of no doghouse in a cold environment, the dog being outside, caused it to bark all night, making Joe very tired. And he hit an extra semicolon, which compiled just fine, but it caused a bug in production out in the wild. Jane got angry and wasn't able to purchase her product. So why does all this matter for preventing and detecting? Let's put our point of view at different places. What if our point of view is right here? If I say as a tester, I've detected this problem. I was testing and I found out that when I click purchase in the test environment, up comes a bug. And I say, hey, I've reported this bug and the developer, Joe, says, oh, thank goodness you caught that. And he makes the change. He deletes that semicolon, checks the code back in. They roll out a new version. It might be reasonable to say by detecting this problem, I've also prevented Jane from getting angry and prevented the company from losing money. So I have helped prevent something, prevent problems. Let's move our point of view here. What if I'm sitting in a code review and I notice there's an extra semicolon here way before it gets to production? And Joe says, oh, I'm glad you caught that. He hits set backspace and they check it in it might be reasonable to say if i detected this i have prevented that bug from ever occurring therefore preventing jane from getting angry therefore preventing the company from losing money so depending on where you put your point of view it might be reasonable to say that you have detected something therefore potentially uh detected something therefore potentially preventing other problems different forms of problems as well and this happens anywhere if i detected the dog maybe i can put a muzzle on it and it doesn't bark all night. Therefore, I've prevented Joe from being too tired and typing the extra semicolon and so on and so forth. Now, some of you may be interested. What was Jane trying to buy anyway? She was trying to buy a doghouse for her poor cold dog. So somehow in this time paradox, she has caused her own bug. So I hope you enjoyed that. All right. So what? The potential effects of word choice could matter. Words matter. They affect us emotionally and our perception of things. And consider causality and perspective. It might be both reasonable to say that as a tester, you have detected something, therefore preventing other forms or further causal for, uh, forms of that same problem. Uh, I'm also looking at the clock and I see we're really close to the end of time and I've still got a few slides to go. Feel free to stick around, feel free to bail. Uh, my, my website's ineffable-solutions.com. Uh, there's a recorded version of this talk. And I also think that Co uh, Code Palooza is going to make these talks available. So if you have to leave and can't catch the end of it here, maybe you can catch the complete version at a later time. Uh, Stephen, turn bug has negative connotations. Developers can take personally. Absolutely. Just have to realize and understand that bugs happen. So it shouldn't be taken personally. Easier said than done. Abs I agree with you. But... We can't always control how other people feel. I think that being called a resource is fine, but I understand that other people take umbrage to that, so I'm sensitive to that. And even though I think it's fine and the dictionary definitions of resource is actually something I think is reasonable to call a human being, sometimes the way it's said or the way that someone perceives or interprets it, uh, they don't like it, so I'm sensitive to that. All right, moving on. Help. This is a con uh, catenkative verb. It is a type of verb. It makes it easier. What it means is it makes it easier for someone to do something. It improves the situation to be benefit or assistance to. Uh, this is a verb that can be followed directly by another verb and extend its meaning. So why is this little tiny word so important in this sentence? Let's go back to our story. There's our bug. Let's put our point of view right here. Is it reasonable to say as a tester that if I'm testing in a testing environment and I'm putting in credit card information and a test uh, address, and I click purchase and up comes a bug. Did I do that by myself? Do I need someone to hold my hand as I do that? Do I need help to detect this particular bug or problem? No, it's something I can do by myself. Now, if you expand the context unreasonably, it might be also reasonable to say, well, someone created the program. You didn't create the application yourself. Okay, so I needed help. Somebody had to create it so that I could test it. And somebody might say, well, you're on a computer. Did you build the computer yourself? Did you? Uh, melt the sand to make the silicon? No, okay, I guess technically we all need help with everything that we do. But within a reasonable context, I think it's reasonable to say that a tester can detect bugs all by themselves. They don't need to any help to detect a problem. But what if I put the point of view right here? What if I'm sitting in a code review and I'm reading down through the code and I don't have enough chops to actually write the code, but I'm okay at reading it. And I notice two semicolons and I'm like, that doesn't seem right. Now, maybe it's reasonable to say I can detect that all by myself. 
But what about preventing it? I say, hey, there's an extra semicolon here. I can't code. And maybe at this company, I don't have the privilege or right or ability to check out code, make changes, check it back in. That's not my part of my roles or responsibilities. So I have to say, hey, Joe, there's an extra semicolon. He says, no problem. He checks out the code, removes the semicolon, checks it back into the branch, and they push it out. In that case, I detected it by myself, but I needed help to prevent the other problems. So consider where you are in this causality chain. What is the problem that you're looking at, and can you do it by yourself, or do you need assistance? Put your point of view anywhere. Can I muzzle this dog by myself? If so, then maybe I don't need any help at all. And if I can detect it and prevent that by myself, maybe it's reasonable to say I prevented these other things without any help at all. So what? The inclusion or exclusion of the word help might change the meaning of the phrase drastically, in fact. And secondly, consider that the specific problem that you're looking at, whether it's a bug, uh, extra semicolon, a barking dog, and if detection or prevention of that particular problem can be done alone or if it requires assistance from others. If so, then maybe you need the word help in your sentence. All right. Uh, let's see, Thomas, compilers only detect syntax here. The semantics of the code is doing what you told it to do. I very much believe that, yes. Computers aren't so smart after all. They are simply great, incredible rule followers. All right, so next, do and don't. Uh, I'll talk some more about grammar. These are helping verbs. These are verbs that help the main verb of a sentence by extending its meaning. They convey complicated shades of meaning. Um, there's a subtype of this. These are called auxiliary verbs, the verbs that are used in forming tenses or moods or voices of other verbs. A couple types of auxiliary, do and don't, those are the ones that I have in the, at the top there. They talk about present tense, do, uh, did or didn't talk about past tense. And there's a subtype of auxiliary verbs. They're called modal verbs. It's an auxiliary verb that expresses necessity or possibility. And here's some of those. Uh, can and could. These are modal verbs that talk about the ability or possibility that something can happen. May and might, very, very similar. They talk about permission or possibility. Will or would, a request or a consequence of doing something. Must is interesting because it talks about the necessity or a requirement. Something must be done or must not be done. And shall and should, that's a, an interesting category I'm going to talk a little bit more about. It talks about obligation, correctness, or a suggestion. So let's put these different modal verbs into the sentence and see how it changes the meaning. Testers do help prevent, detect, or prevent or detect problems. So they do. Maybe you're talking about the way things are at your company. Or testers didn't help prevent or detect problems. You're talking about something happened in the past. They can help detect or prevent problems. Maybe they have the ability, there's nothing stopping them, they can do it. They may, they have permission. At our company, they may prevent defects or they may detect problems. They will or they must. In fact, at our company, there's a stipulation that says testers must detect problems or they get fired or should. This is the interesting one, should. That is an opinion, it's a suggestion. Testers should prevent problems. Maybe they did detect problems or they can detect problems, but they also should prevent problems. So let's talk about should. What's the difference? The difference is between a descriptive statement, which is something where it's making an, uh, an assertion based on empirical evidence or facts, and a normative statement, which expresses a value judgment or an opinion. So for example, descriptive is an 11 letter word. That statement is a descriptive statement, it's stating a fact. Normative is a much better word. In fact, that sentence is a normative sentence. It's exp expressing a value judgment, a suggestion. So if somebody says should, testers should help prevent or detect problems, recognize that they are making a normative statement. So what? Identify the helping verb that's being used, which one of those mobile, modal helping verbs, and whether it's omitted, whether it's implied in that sentence, and that will help you better understand what might actually be meant, what that person intends to mean, whether it's something in the past, present, or future, whether it's a suggestion, whether it's a statement of fact, and consider if it's a statement of fact or an opinion. And finally, testers, we're nearing the end. Thank you for staying overtime with me. Testers, um, if we, uh, I, as a semanticist, I often start with definitions, and so I want to start with definitions again. But instead of defining testers, I'm going to start with the definition of testing. Um, one of my favorite, I've read hundreds of definitions of testing in many different sources throughout my entire career. And one of my favorites comes from rapid software testing, uh, James Bach and Michael Bolton world. And they define testing as the process of evaluating a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation. And that includes, to some degree, questioning, studying, modeling, obser observation, inference, and many other things. And I like this because it talks a lot about what testing is and how it's done. Another one of my favorite definitions of testing comes from Cam Kaner, professor of testing out of Florida. And he says it's an investigation conducted. Why? 
to provide stakeholders with information about the quality of the product or service under test. This one doesn't say so much about what or how, it's more about why. It includes a reason, a purpose, a goal, which I think is very important. Now, sometimes I mash up these two definitions to give folks a more robust definition of testing. But as I said before, what I usually do is read dozens or even hundreds of definitions from different sources, including just talking to folks. And I come up with my own definition that includes what I believe to be all the essential characteristics, the essential qualities of that thing. So this is my definition of testing. Briefly, it is utilizing various tools and approaches. As a tester, I do utilize very different tools and approaches. And there's different approaches to testing. There's different approaches and methodologies to making software. And I use various ones and various tools, so small tools, big tools, in-depth tools, tools that extend my human capabilities as a tester. In some combination and to some degree, sometimes I use a lot of this, these tools and a few of those tools with a few different processes and approaches and I combine them together and I move context and I change it up and I use less of those tools and more of these different approaches. Why? To help evaluate quality. That's what I'm doing as a tester. I'm assessing, evaluating quality, which is value to someone at some time. How? Via exploration and experimentation. And I'm a scientist. A tester is very much like a scientist. Exploration is uh, exploring and not having any preconceived notions or hypotheses about what might happen, just poking and prodding and pushing and pulling and making notes about what happens. And experimentation, <clears throat> actually formulating a hypothesis. In tech, we call these requirements. So I have some statement about what should happen, and I'm able to run experiments and tests to say, did this thing that we want to happen or should happen actually happen? Why? Often, there are many, many reasons in causality that things happen, but one reason is to pertain uh, uh, to obtain pertinent and useful information. Now, sometimes I test to practice, to get better at it. Sometimes I test for fun. I test for money. But often it's to pertain useful information. And do what with it? Provide it to relevant stakeholders, not give it to my family and friends. They don't really care about my testing results. I give it to people that are relevant stakeholders in that context. Why? To enable more informed, confident decisions. You can make decisions without information, but you might feel less confident if you're not as informed. So a more educated, informed decision is going to give you more confidence in that decision. And that leads to possibly, which may also indirectly lead to increased quality. I may do a wonderful testing performance and give really great relevance results, pertinent, useful information to the right folks, and they decide to ignore it. In that case, the quality might not increase. So it might not lead to increased quality. It may indirectly lead to increased quality, possibly. So why is that important, this definition of testing? Because the definition of tester is simply one who does that, one who performs testing. And why is that important? Because we're talking about whether testers do or don't help prevent or detect problems. Testers do a lot of things, just like developers and BAs and scrum masters and project managers and executives and plumbers and architects and ballet dancers. We all do many, many different things. As I said, I'm an improviser and I'm a dad, and I'm a author, I'm not authoring right now. So it's probably unreasonable at this moment in time to call me an author. Now it's part of who I am, but at this moment I'm not acting in it as an author in that author role. At this moment, I'm also not exploring, experimenting, and providing relevant useful information to stakeholders. So at this moment in time, it's probably also not reasonable to call me a tester. So why does that matter? We're talking about whether testers prevent or detect problems. What if I notice an extra semicolon in the code or I'm testing along and a bug comes up and I detect that and I say, ah, I'm exploring, I'm experimenting, I'm reading code. That's part of exploring, experimenting. It doesn't have to be just code. You can explore and experiment on ideas and requirements. In that case, I am testing. Now, what if I then do have the ability, the, uh, I know how to code and the company has given me permission to check out code, make changes, check it back in. So I'm sitting at my desk, I'm checking out the code, and I hit delete and I remove that semicolon and I check it back in. There's nothing in the definition of testing that talks about checking out code, changing code, checking it back in. At that moment, I'm not a tester. So while I might be preventing a problem, I'm not a tester that's preventing a problem. In that moment, I'm acting as a developer. But what if at my company, it says that testing is utilizing various tools and approaches in different degrees, exploring, experimenting, and checking out code and making code changes and checking it back in. That's the definition of testing at this company. Just like they had a glossary that said done, done, done. Their definition of testing says, yeah, testers can make changes to code. In that case, as a tester, I am in fact preventing a problem as I'm changing the code. So what, why does this matter? The definition of testing in your context at your company might drastically change the meaning of the entire phrase. 
Consider the actions that are being performed to better understand the accuracy of the phrase. What exactly is being done? Are you doing a testing activity or a non-testing activity? So testers detect defects. Possibly testers don't prevent problems. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Testers must help detect bugs. They should, that's a normative phrase. They should help prevent bugs, someone's opinion. They can, they, they have the ability to prevent failures. They can't help prevent issues. Well, maybe, maybe not at your company. In summary, testers, understanding the definition of testing uh, can help you better understand the role and the responsibilities of tester, and therefore it'll help you better understand the phrase. Do and don't, those two little tiny words, those modal verbs, identify which helping verb is being used and consider if it's a statement of fact or opinion. Help, that little tiny word has a big impact. Consider how the inclusion or exclusion or implication of that word affects the meaning of the entire phrase. Preventing and detecting, remember, that the word choice can affect someone emotionally, and it also matters on your point of view. Remember that where you put your point of view in the causality chain, you can it's reasonable to say you detected this, but therefore potentially prevented other problems. And again, problems by any other name are subjective. Using different words for problems can make people feel different ways. They may have legal ramifications, and they're only from some point of view. Now, a tester friend of mine recently tweeted something out, and I thought it summed up this entire presentation nicely. Keith Klein said, what if we spent more time talking to each other about what words actually mean instead of being wound up about what we think people meant by them? I love that sentiment. I think it's a nice summary of this entire uh, presentation. Words do matter. Semantics is significant. Please seek understanding, even if you don't uh, arrive at agreement, because it's all about communication and understanding. So thank you very much. My name is Damien, and uh, thanks for staying over. I'm happy to stick around and answer questions, or you can reach out to me at my website. Thank you so much. And now I get to read back through all these comments I missed. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Jan or Jan, I'm not sure, but thank you. Either way, thanks, Jessica. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming back.